the talk I'm going to give, the conversation I'm going to start is a surprise to me, to myself, who's giving the talk. And it's a surprise in two ways. One is that it came to me fully formed in fully constructed sentences today. And so very unusually, I have some paper in front of me. So I'll look down a little bit, but um, that's how it came. So, and the other thing is that I'm surprised by the talk because it, it's pulling together threads from, you know, decades of thinking that I never saw how they merged. And yet here it is. A couple of weeks ago, I, I was wondering like, what am I doing in a technology university um, studying robots? And then this really clear voice in my head said, trust the path I sent you on. So I, I'm trusting <laughs> for the talk. <laughs> so I'm weaving together phenomenology of touch, which is based on some, a lot of uh, philosophical research. Um, I'm going to be exploring relational ontology, examining new grocery shopping technology, and, and critiquing a little bit of the attention economy and inviting you into practice, which I think we're commonly interested in. And so while this, this merging together is new, to me this afternoon, <laughs> none of this is new at all because I've been nourished by these ideas for as long as I can remember at my parents' dinner table. This was a place where there was rosemary and thyme and perfect soups that cannot be replicated made by my mother. And it's a place where there was debate often heated about what food to eat, where on the one side, there was the argument that the health food store was a safe haven. And on the other side, the health food store was a place for the local elite. And this was not a good thing. <laughs> and touch, the phenomenology of touch, which I'm, I will be really diving into. This is a thread that I've, I've studied through my master's and my, and my doctoral work now. But of course, it's a thread as the beginning, the beginning of my life, even before I was out of my mother's womb. It is the first sense to develop in the womb. And when I was there, I was held utterly and completely. And then when I came out into the world, of course, I've been held utterly and completely, but in a different way. Touch is surprisingly sits in the middle of my love language list, and yet it's what I've been studying for years. I've learned that there's a hierarchy of the senses at the top in my culture. At the top, there's seeing and hearing, and this rank the highest. They're associated with the intellect, the mind, and man, taste, smell, and touch are base and of the body associated with emotions and femininity and thus to be avoided in serious circles, especially in the philosophy departments. But touch, and I'm sure smell and taste as well, it's just not my, what I've, my area of inquiry, but touch is so beautiful in its base flesh, fleshiness, its emotion, and maybe its femininity. I think that it, it points to our, in how our embodiment inevitably requires a connection with the world, one which we can't shirk or get rid of, though so many people try with this idea of a supposedly embodied meta-verse. Touch is the thing that we cannot not do. It is both an example and a metaphor to our primordial interconnectedness. And so we may get real for a moment. Everybody can hold their own hand. <laughs> However you like, you can move around as well. And 
I challenge you to find the precise boundary between one side and the other. Try to discern which hand is touching and which is touched. This wonderful sense eludes the binaries that clever minds try to separate and make up. Our skin is just like our place in the world. It is porous. Touching is never going to be a connection between one and the other like this. It's always an infusion, an infusion that laughs in the face of individualism and separation. And I've read this in books and the science shows it. There's research, but we don't need any of that because of course you also know that humans are remarkably good at communicating through this porous meeting place in the flesh. Our bodies, often our hands, but all of our bodies communicate what our mouths sometimes do not. There's really interesting nursing research that shows prejudice and bias finds its way out in the hands. Some people are told non-verbally that they deserve to be handled with care. Some people are told that they deserve to be handled with neglect. And we know that this mode of communication goes well beyond the hospital walls. Some people are led carefully and delicately. Some people are pushed. Some people are choked. Some people's boundaries are respected and some people's boundaries are transgressed. I have a little daughter and I am going to have a baby boy in a few months. And boys, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I notice, and I hope I don't do it, but we'll see. But boys, little baby boys are often jostled and tossed and little girls are treated as delicate. I love this idea that though we say certain things, our prejudice and our social ideas about things, there's truth in the hands that maybe we don't say. And so, I wonder what you and I say to the more than human world with our felt, with our feet, with our hands and even the flesh of our cheeks. Years ago, I was wandering around a meadow and I became sort of paralyzed by my inability not to destroy. I was sort of lifting my feet up where I stood and sort of panicking, maybe I'll sit down, but of course, sitting down squashes more than feet. <laughs> and so perhaps then I thought touch might really have something to teach me about my culture's separation and hierarchy between life and death. There's an entanglement there too. And so we can turn as well now to um, the more than human world that we touch in varying degrees each day, food, that which nourishes us. We pick and squeeze, peel and chop, lift to our nose and put on our tongue. How often are these moments communicating thanks? And how often do we say to that which keeps us alive? Do we toss and shove and treat without care or gratitude? Either way, in the last years, so much of this initial uh, relationship building and communication has been traded for scrolling and clicking. We scroll and click, click our items and then they're delivered to our home, especially through the pandemic. But of course, these habits have been ingrained in our weekly shopping after we can go back to stores. 
the screen is a surface that many of us have, you know, deeply personal relationships with, but of course it lacks the particularity of the lemon rind. It, it, it lacks the particularity of the tomato, each one unique. Under the insidious guise of efficiency and this cultural obsession with optimizing each aspect of our lives and our day and each moment, we have lost so many opportunities for connection and for communication with our through and with our bodies. So lately, I have been experimenting with reconnecting. My weekly shopping has been, is now in constant tinkering, but is spread out over um, in, in, in several small shops. And I feel what comes home with me <laughs> before it comes home. I ask the lemons which one would like to join the basket. Of course, not out loud, which is good for social reasons maybe too. <laughs> Remarkably, though, maybe not obviously, caring and attentive touch transforms the very metaphysics of my kitchen. The hours between five and seven with a 16 month old daughter, these hours so tight just to need dinner made and eaten, bath and bed. And until recently, they were so fraught with tension and urgency. The time was so tight and constricting. And the space too, inevitably I'd be turning around to get to the sink and bump into something. And then I decided just slowly, I don't know why, but slowly just to sort of start touching with attention and intention, sweetly saying, thank you, cauliflower. Much gratitude, onion. <laughs> all with my hands. All in the same space. All within the same time. And yet the hours between five and seven were suddenly fused with spaciousness. And so my body suddenly wasn't bumping into things anymore. The kitchen was more than large enough even with a child at my feet playing with pots. <laughs> it's all possible. There was, as they say, spaciousness suddenly. And that was through that base sense, the one disregarded touch. I ease into this relationship, this relationship that already is, always is. I can't be without it, but now I have attended to it. And suddenly there's more ease, more care, and more respect. And those are my thoughts on touch and food and attention and metaphysics and ontology, <laughs> weaving all of the philosophical words together, phenomenology as well. <laughs> and uh, the question I shared with Nathan was, we can explore anything of, those, of, of any of those ideas. But the question I had thought was, if touch is this powerful nonverbal communicator, how often are we saying thank you to our food, that, that which nourishes us? And, and how often are we, are we rushing and, 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 and not speaking words of gratitude? So thank you. <laughs>